Howdy. The purpose of this video is to describe one specific kind of a linear defect, and that is an edge dislocation. Um, so we're going to start off by showing you what an edge dislocation is. What I'm uh, showing you here is a, a bubble array. So this is a whole bunch of bubbles floating on the surface of some liquid. Um, and at first glance, it looks like a perfect uh, lattice. Um, but if I look closer, I can see that if I draw one row of bubbles there and another row here, I have an extra row in between the two. Uh, and it ends at some point. So there's a defect there. So like I said, this is a two-dimensional representation. But if you can imagine the same thing in three dimensions, we would have a crystal lattice with an extra half a plane of atoms. And that edge uh, that bounds uh, that extra half a lane, uh, plane is called an edge dislocation. Um, as a side note, if we look closely, we see another kind of a defect, and that's a point defect called a vacancy. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is the Berger's vector of an edge dislocation. And the Berger's vector is an important concept because it helps uh, describe um, the character of a dislocation in a material. Um, and the whole idea is that if I drew a circuit um, in a perfect crystal lattice, so let's focus up here for a second. If I go two to the right, two down, two to the left, and two up, then that will form a closed circuit. Um, if I, however, tried to do the same thing around a dislocation, that circuit will no longer close. And the Berger's vector is the vector um, that uh, completes the circuit, essentially. So the first thing that we need to do is identify the dislocation itself. Um, and if you look closely, you see there's an extra half a plane of atoms here. And remember, the edge dislocation is the line, uh, the linear defect that forms the boundary of that extra half a plane. So if I connected these three atoms in a line, um, that is the edge dislocation. So it's a line that's extending into and out of the plane. And the symbol for an edge dislocation looks like a T, where this lower prong of the T is pointing towards that extra half a plane of atoms. Okay, let's draw the Berger's vector, but first I need to, um, in order to get the sign of the Berger's vector uh, properly, uh, I need to indicate some sort of sense to the dislocation itself. So I'm going to create a sense vector. Um, this is a symbol for a vector that's going into the plane. And that's important uh, because we use, uh, we use the right-hand rule to define the sign of the Berger's vector. So we're going to use the right-hand start-to-finish uh, convention. Uh, it's not as important which convention you use. Different people use different conventions, but you need to be consistent. Uh, and this is especially important when you start to have different uh, defects interacting uh, with each other. Okay. So if I, if I applied the right-hand rule and I use this sense vector, then my thumb is pointing into the plane and I'm basically going to pr proceed in a circuit this way. So let's start somewhere. Let's start here um, and let's, let's try and make a loop that's, say, four atoms on a side. So I'm going to start uh, by going to the left, two atoms. I'll go up, four atoms, uh, one, two, three, four. I'll go to the right four atoms, one, two, three, four, and I'll go down four atoms, one, two, three, four. Uh, and then remember, because I start off going to the left two, I need to go to the left two more. And so you see um, my circuit is no longer complete, right? So I have four on the bottom side, four on the left, four on the top, four on the right. If there was no dislocation there, uh, that would make a closed box. Um, but because this is around that edge dislocation, the loop is no longer complete. Um, so I use the right-hand rule to go from this way. I started here and I finished here. The final thing is, is this SF. And so in this convention, the vector goes from the start to the finish. And so the Berger's vector in this case is uh, one unit cell length. If this, is, if this is a unit cell here, it's one unit cell length from the left to the right. And usually that's denoted by the vector B. Um, so importantly, for the edge dislocations, we see that the Berger's vector is perpendicular to the dislocation, right? The dislocation is a vector that's going into and out of the page, and the Berger's vector is going from the left to the right. So those two are perpendicular. Okay, 
Next, let's talk about stress fields in this system. Um, where is there, uh, how is this uh, lattice stressed because of the presence of a defect? Now, if we think about it, um, we can, we can kind of concentrate on the fact that we're squeezing this extra half a plane of atoms uh, into the lattice. So again, let's label uh, the dislocation. The region um, that's on the side with the extra half a plane atom tends to be under compression. I'll put C for compression. Uh, and, and this makes sense, right? Because we've tried to squeeze more atoms into there. So all of these things are compressed together relatively uh, tightly. Um, looking at the opposite view, the region on the opposite side tends to be in tension, T for tension. Um, and, and I could think about that, um, it, uh, just the inverse case, right? Instead of adding an extra half a plane, let's say I subtract half a plane above. Now the atoms are relatively further apart than they would be in equilibrium, uh, and so they're all under tension. Um, the other thing that you can see is that we see shear to the left and the right. And the easiest way to see that is to just look at this unit cell here and this unit cell here, right? And again, you can think about it in, in terms of compensating for this extra half a plane of atoms. So the bottom part is spread out a little bit relative to the top part, and that manifests itself uh, in terms of shear in one sense off to the left side, uh, and then shear the other sense off to the right side. So this is generally true. For an edge dislocation, we have a compression field, we have a tension field, and then we have two shear fields. Um, okay, so finally, we're going to talk about uh, motion of edge dislocations. So what happens if I take an edge dislocation and then I apply a shear force to the lattice? And so in this case, we have an edge dislocation here. Let's switch back to green. Um, and now it, the extra half plane is in the top half of our lattice. And we're applying a shear force. So I'm trying to shear that top half uh, to the right and the bottom half to the left. So this is applying a shear force. And we can ask the question, what does this do um, to the dislocation? And, and the response is that the dislocation is going to move in response to that shear. Uh, you can think about this a couple different ways. Um, one way to think about this is just to sort of think about the final point. If I'm shearing, uh, if, if I'm shearing the lattice, this top half wants to move to the right relative to the bottom half. And so one way for it to do that is for this uh, dislocation to um, move subsequently, um, to move all the way out. Um, and the net effect of this is for that top um, half of the lattice to shear one unit cell off to the right hand side. Um, you can also think about it in terms of uh, interaction with these uh, stress fields and the shear that's being applied. Um, I, I tend to think that this this approach makes a little bit more sense to me. Um, so what do we what do we do? We're applying a shear force and we see that the dislocation is moving in the same direction as the applied shear force. Um, also, the dislocation is moving, um, the direction of motion is parallel to the Berger's vector. So remember, the Berger's vector, uh, for this case, looks something like that. Um, the dislocation is moving in a parallel direction. Uh, Finally, the direction of motion is perpendicular to the dislocation itself. So the dislocation, again, is coming in and out of the plane, uh, but it's moving to the right.